because of what we were when we began, because of what we did strive to be. Our founders called it the great experiment, and it was a great experiment, and it worked for a long, long time. It started working until we took plurality way too seriously and we tried to please everyone. And I've discovered that when you try to please everyone, you wind up pleasing no one. And that's about where we are in this nation. But still, with all of our problems, with all of our troubles, with all that we are, we're still the greatest nation on earth. And in spite of the fact that I, I believe that we're under the judgment of God somewhat already, and we may may even fall under worse judgment, and, and according to Scripture, we will before all things are said and done. But still, we are the people of God, and still we enjoy the blessings of God. And so I want you to open your hymnal to number 646. Our vacation Bible school camp this year. We sang the first verse of this song when we pledged allegiance to the flag. We display the United States flag in our, serve, in our church, and most Baptist churches do display the American flag and also the Christian flag. But this morning, let's do something that we rarely do. Let's stand together and let's all pledge allegiance to this flag. The flag of the United States of America. So let's stand. And as we do in Bible school, attention. Salute. Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we sit back down and sing, y'all correct me if I'm wrong or if I'm just making it up, but just now I had a memory. When we were school kids, when I was in, you know, early grades, we would stand and pledge allegiance to the flag. And would we not do this, I pledge allegiance to the flag. Am I making that up or did we do that? Well, there it is. We call it Old Glory. Let's sing number 646. Right. 
write this song you should know. And if I forget it, y'all sing the right words, okay? This is a prayer. So as we sing it, let's pray unto the Lord. God bless America.
about a year now. And uh, well, everything's still going pretty good. I said, yeah, I've still got them fooled. <laughs> but anyway, you know, getting back to the fact of, of this country being what we are. You know, we, we always say that America was kind of founded to be a place of religious freedom. And it was, but those of you who are students of American history, you will know that it wasn't always that way. Even right here in America, some of the groups that came from England continued to carry on in the English traditions of not separating church from state. And they had in mind of enforcing the church laws to the point of putting people in jail if they didn't conform. And it was a fellow by the name of Roger Williams and a crowd called the Baptist uh, that kindly fought this tendency and led the way to finally getting uh, what we call religious liberty for all people based not upon a decree of the king, based not upon a vote of the government, but based upon the consciences of men, women, boys, and girls. And uh, it was written right into the fabric of the first 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights to our Constitution that gives us the freedom to meet, to assemble, to worship God in a way that we see fit to do so. And I, for one, am grateful. Amen. I am grateful that we can assemble today without fear of a Gestapo type police force coming in here and arresting us and hauling us off to jail or to some concentration camp somewhere, or at least it hasn't gotten that way yet. Okay, so we're grateful and we're thankful for that. Um, so this morning as we, uh, we think along the lines of American citizenship, and that's what I'm gonna be talking to you about this morning a little bit here in a few moments. Let's continue to be very much in prayer for our country. You know, all of us, all of us are what's called, you know, you've heard of armchair quarterbacks on Sunday. Well, all of us are armchair politicians. We think we know better than the, than the powers that be. Hello. We know better than the commissioners. We know better than the governor and the state legislature. We know better than the president and the Congress of the United States. And we sure know more than the Supreme Court ever thought about knowing. And we let it all be known. <laughs> what we know. The truth of the matter is, if all that we know was gathered together and put in a thimble, it probably wouldn't even cover the bottom of it. I'm not much of a politician. I'm too opinionated. And I, I have an opinion and I hold to it. And I'm sure that you're probably a little bit that way. But as I said, this, is, this country is hard citizenship. When you start granting freedoms to people who are diametrically opposed to what you believe at every turn, that's tough citizenship, y'all. Hello? That is tough citizenship. So we need to be very much in prayer for our country. You know, that God would, would use us in spite of ourselves. Um, I was looking over the prayer list that was handed to me this morning and um, there's, there's a lot of names on this prayer list, people that are right here in our church. And some of them, even that are here this morning, they're undergoing fiery trials, sicknesses and stuff and they're, they're trying to find out what's wrong with them. And I think I said either last week or a couple of weeks ago about you know, death being on our trail and, uh, and uh, you know, well, Gary stumbled this week and almost let him catch up with him. Yeah. But thank the Lord, you know, that, uh, uh, that that's not so, but that just goes to show y'all. We never know from one week to the next what it's going to be. We really don't. And I just thank the Lord that we're all gathered back here today and that we're in as good a shape as what we are in. But let's remember those that are not able to be here because of sickness 
And uh, I just, just pray for each and every one of these. Most of these are, are members of our church here. So let's just pray for one another. I wonder if anybody has any special spoken prayer requests now that you'd like to mention before we pray. Anywhere in the house. Miss Pat. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Right here. I would like to do my fiance to let me know speaking class. Yes, ma'am. Did I see another hand back right, right here? Uh, pray for our children, too, because there are a lot of these kids that are going on the internet and they're letting these older people talk to do what they can do. Yeah. Suzanne. Yesterday, I went to Fayetteville to make funeral arrangements for Parrish that was sitting right here last week. And when I look at that flag, he was a veteran. And yesterday making those arrangements, he was in the Army and there, that flag is embroidered just like that one's hanging on the register book. And you know, it, this he was such a patriotic person. But just pray for his mom, Kim Gordy, and his children. Yes, ma'am. And me. Mr. Richard. Anyone else? Right here. Yes, ma'am. My dad's home today. He's, uh, he's got him all in there. He's on Friday. He's got floors in his lungs. He's had it for a long time. Where his lungs grow together real bad. And he's got him on top of it now. It's just he's having a hard time. Okay. Candy. Is he holding his own? Let's bow our heads together then, please. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Let me just ask one last time for any that might have any unspoken request. You'd just like to let it be known to the Lord by uplifted hand. I invite you just to raise your hand. Hold them up for just a moment. My, my, all over the house. Our Father, as we bow in your presence, Lord, this morning, we thank you. We praise you, Father, for all that you're doing among us. Lord, you bless us. And uh, we we recognize the blessings, Lord. And we we rejoice in all of the good things that come our way. Father, there's a lot of what we call bad things that come. And we forget, Lord, that it takes the good and the bad in the recipe all working together, Lord, to come out to the ultimate good that you have for us. But we have a tendency, Lord, to forget that. and We want all sunshine and no rain, Lord. We, we want all health and no pain. And, and, and Father, we pray for... For folks as they're suffering. We're not downplaying it by no means. But Lord we ask that you would draw close to people Lord. That you would be with them in whatever situations and circumstances that they're walking through. And that Lord that they would find in you their strength and their peace. The source dear Lord of their being able to get through uh, whatever it is they're going through. And dear Lord to be able to. Give witness to you, Lord, for all that you're doing and perhaps making an impact in other people's lives, Lord, while they're doing it. We thank you, Lord, for every person who is here today. Pray your finest blessings, Lord, be upon each and every one of them. And Father, as we're rolling up upon another national birthday for this country, Lord, our prayer in the song that we sang, God, Bless America. You have 
bless America, Lord, in days past and gone. Because America, Lord, has stood true to you. And Lord, has done more to raise uh, the cause of good and even the cause of the scripture and the Lord Jesus in the world than any other nation on the earth in history. And Lord, we thank you for all that has been done. But Lord, we can't rest upon the has-beens. Lord, we are in the here and the now. And Lord, things are not so good. We look around, Lord, we see uh, as, as David in his lament over Jonathan and Saul, how are the mighty fallen? And it seems to Lord that we've fallen a great deal from what was once our lofty estate. We pray, dear Lord Jesus, that for those who know you, for those who do know their God, that they would do exploits, as the scripture said, Lord, that we'd be salt, that we would be light, and that we would continue to point men, women, boys, and girls to Jesus, Lord. Now be with us in this service. Please guide us and direct us always in the way that pleases you. And we'll be forever grateful. For it is in Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen. amen. And amen. I'm just looking at the, the list that Miss Pat always hands me on Sunday morning. Today is Richard and Karen Jenkins' anniversary. All right. I'm not going to ask how long. How much? Fifty-seven. Wow. It's Chris and Dolores Weaver's anniversary on tomorrow. All right. Dolores, has he give you that new diamond bracelet yet? I wasn't supposed to say anything about that. I'm sorry. All righty then. Well, happy anniversary to y'all. There's a birthday on here, but they're not here today, so I think they might have got spared from being called out, but I'll leave this right here and I'll call them out the next time they come. All right. <laughs> Give you just a minute or two to stand up and fellowship for just a minute or two, and then we'll receive our offering and get right on with the service.
morning offering. Let's bow our heads together. Brother Bill, would you ask God's blessing on the offering, please, sir? Well, I'm going to share with you another ponderment sermon today. And today, my ponderment is on Christian citizenship. And notice what I said, Christian citizenship. You see, ladies and gentlemen, there's a terrible tendency that we have as Christians. We have a tendency to want to separate life into two categories. We want to separate it into the sacred and then into the secular. We want to say that there are two trains of thought, that there are two ways of living, that we are really bipolar in nature, which we are bipolar in nature, the truth of the matter is. But when one is a Christian, it doesn't mean that he's only Christian under certain circumstances. And then he can act in different ways, in different circumstances. You've heard, I'm sure, as we all have, of Sunday Christians. That's what they're called. Sunday Christians. The Christians on Sunday. But on Monday through Saturday, 
You can't tell them from anybody else. They look the same. They talk the same. They walk the same. They think the same. And nothing more is, is more shameful than for a Christian not to be a Christian in all walks of life. You see, when we're Christian, it means that there's a fundamental change that takes place on the inside. So that now we are Christian in everything that we do and everywhere that we are and every relationship that we have. Are you with me? You understand what I'm saying? I mean, we should be Christian not just at the church house, but at our house. We should be Christian in the marketplace. We should be Christian on the job. We should be Christians in our neighborhoods. Everywhere we are, we should be Christians. Fundamentally, first and foremost, because everything we do and say is a reflection on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you understand that there are people that are watching your life. As a matter of fact, you're the only Bible that some people are reading. And they're reading the Bible of your life. And they're coming to some conclusions about Jesus by watching you. And a lot of times they're saying something like this. Well, if he is a Christian, the woods are full of them. If she is a Christian, then I don't want to be one. Boy, what a shame that would be. And nothing is more so than in this business of being a Christian citizen. Are you listening to me? You see, when the Lord saves us, a lot of times I, you know, I've often thought that it would be a great thing for the Lord just to save us. You know, He saves us. And in the midst of all of our celebrating, oh man, we're celebrating, we're saved by the grace of God. We've been forgiven of our sins. Man, we're up there on that mountaintop. We ought to just drop dead with a heart attack right then and go on to heaven. Hello. But no, that's not what happens. God saves us and He leaves us right exactly where we are. And then we go to moaning and groaning. But you don't understand how things are in my family. Sure I do. Sure I do. But God meant to put a Christian in the midst of that mess. Amen. Hello? You just don't know what kind of crowd I work around. Sure I do. But God intended to put a Christian light in the middle of that darkness. Amen. You see, that's why God saves us. He saves us so that we can serve Him. And we need to be Christian in our citizenship. So there's two passages of Scripture that I want to call your attention to this morning. And I'm just going to call your attention to them as, I, as I'm pointing out a few things to you about this business of Christian citizenship. Now, the first passage that I want you to see is in the book of 1 Timothy, chapter number 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Now there's seven points in this sermon. It's about as pointed as a porcupine. But these seven words are rhyming words. They all rhyme with each other. And I hope when the service is over that you'll remember some of them. And more than that, I hope that you'll put them into practice in your life if you're not practicing them already. The first thing we see in 1 Timothy, chapter number 2, verses 1 through 3, I exhort therefore that first of all, the priority, if you will, supplications, prayers, intercessions, 
and giving of thanks be made for all men. Now that doesn't mean men only. It means all of humankind. All men. Everywhere. Regardless of nationality. Regardless of color or creed. Prayer is to be made for all men. And then notice the first thing he says in verse 2. For kings. And for all that are in authority. I find it interesting that the first thing that's mentioned after it's established that we're to pray for all men everywhere across the spectrum and leave none out Yet specifically and specially on that list are kings and those that are in authority. Now, it's, it's constantly changing. The United Nations is kind of changing things all the time. But there are plus or minus 200 nations in the world. Are you with me? 200 nations. And all of those nations. Are controlled. By one. Or two people. There are those that are called presidents. There are others that are kings. There are others that are chairmen. Of their particular party. There are those who are called prime ministers. Uh, there are those who, who are called dictators. Flat out. The supreme power. And when you put all of those people together. If you allow for two major leaders. In every one of the countries. Now you're talking about 400 people. Now, I want to let that sink into you. 400 people on this planet of 8 billion people that have power vested in them. Are you listening to me? You understand and know. I mean, for example, we think of, of Vladimir Putin. We think of him and, and, and Russia, the nation of Russia. And when we think of Russia declaring war on the United States, or when we say something like, you know, Putin's going to do this or Putin's going to do that, you do understand that it is not the millions of people of Russia who are doing anything. It's Vladimir Putin. One man who is in control of that country's army and their resources. So the first key thing that we need to pray for is our leaders and those who are in charge. And the reason that we pray is that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. I don't know about you, but I enjoy traveling on roads that I don't have to worry about uh, armed bandits most of the time stopping me and robbing me. Now it happens every once in a while, but not often. I'm grateful to be able to walk the streets of our little town about any time and I don't have any fear. Maybe I ought to fear more, but I don't have any right now. Are you listening to me? God says, the first thing as a Christian citizen, pray. Pray. Pray for our leaders. Pray for them. Pray for the leaders of the United States of America. Our president, his cabinet, the Congress, both houses. 
the nine members of the United States Supreme Court, the 11 appellate court systems, federal courts across the country, the 50 governors of the 50 states, all of the state legislatures, and all of the hundreds of thousands of counties and the county governments, we need to pray, pray, pray for our leaders as a Christian citizen. Now, turn to Romans chapter 13, if you would, please. Romans chapter 13. Begins like this. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. And the powers that be. Are ordained of God. Now I'm fixing to make a statement that y'all not. I'm sure that many of you are going to disagree with me. But I want you to let it. You know, I want you to, to chew on it for a little while before you have words with me. Are you ready? In the eyes of God, in the heart of God, a bad government is better than no government at all. A dictatorship is better than anarchy. The Bible says that power is all of God and it's ordained of God that men, women, boys, and girls be ruled. There is no such thing as ultimate freedom. Why? Because we're sinners. And that's what the governments of the world will not admit. They, they do not write that into their constitutions that men are sinners. But the Bible says we are, that we have a sin problem. That's what the problem is. And that's why it takes law to try to keep us in line. And God says, it's ordained by me. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. Human government is ordained of God, ladies and gentlemen. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he that beareth not, he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore you must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. So first of all, we are to pray for our leaders. Secondly, we are to obey the laws of the land. Let me say that again. Obey the laws of the land. Now, I'm one year in. I was pretty popular a while ago. I may lose my popularity right now. Because there are some things, ladies and gentlemen, that we make light of that we ought not to make light of. There are some things we do that we ought not do. You do understand that when I say obey the laws of the land, what I mean is we are to obey the law whether we like them or whether we don't. Whether we approve of them or whether we don't. Because if we don't approve of the law, there's a process that we can go through to try to get the law changed. But if we just decide we don't like that law and we thumb our nose at that law and we go ahead, we become a law unto ourselves, And that is rebellion against God. There's some things that I don't like. 
I can't understand why a man can't do on his property what he wants to do. Amen. If he owns property, it's his. He's paying the taxes on it. Why can't he build a chicken coop on it if he wants to? Hello? If he wants to drag an old car and put it in the front yard and let it stay there for 30 years, he ought to be able to because it's his. But oh no, there's some laws in place that won't let you do that. And we all, these laws, some of them are unpopular. And I agree with you that some of them need to be changed. But as a Christian, as a Christian, we are to obey the laws of the land. And one of the laws is thou shalt not exceed the speed limit that's on the sign. I told you I'm not going to be popular. We make fun of it. We make light of it. So much so that we brag on how fast we can get from one town to the other. Man, I made it from here to Charlotte in 10 minutes. That's about right. That's about the way the traffic flows on 85. And we brag about it. Oh, I never go to speed limit. And when I set my cruise control, I set it 14 above whatever the speed limit is. And then we get stopped. And then we get mad. Hello? When the, Bible, when the law says thou shalt not and we break it, we become lawbreakers. May I remind you what James said? When you break one law, it's just like you broke them all. So we are to pray for our leaders. We are to obey the law, even the unpopular ones, because if we're Christian, we want to be a good Christian citizen. And obey the law. Verse 6. For this cause pay ye tribute also. For they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due. Custom to whom custom. Let me stop right there. Number 3. Pay your various taxes. Hmm. Last thing that you thought you would ever hear on a Sunday morning coming from a Baptist preacher in the church would be pay your taxes. Oh, what an unpopular subject taxes is. Have you ever thought about how many taxes we pay, y'all? It's a sight in this world. They tax you when you make it. They tax you when you spend it. They tax you when you invest it. They tax you when you save it. Hello? Sometimes they tax it just to tax it. And we pay, we pay, we pay, we pay. And sometimes it seems like it's so ridiculous. And yet, look what the scripture says for this cause. Hey, you tribute also for their God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Man, I tell you what, you might not think that that crowd of county commissioners and them, that bunch of Rowan County, you might not think they're God's ministers, but God says they are. You might not think that crowd down at Raleigh is God's ministers, but God says they are. And you sure don't think that crowd in Washington is God's ministers, but God says they are. They are His ministers. They are in place. They're the powers that be. And yet, we're to pay our taxes. I invite you, I encourage you, I implore you, take advantage of every tax law you possibly can. If there's a loophole, go through it. If there's a way around it, go around it. Tunnel under it. Do whatever you can do. Legally speaking, take advantage of everything that you possibly can. But pay 
what you owe. Because if there's anything that's bad, it's to look in the paper. When they run the paper of all the delinquent taxes, and right down there, you know, you might as well put Reverend by my name. Reverend Rex Ware. Boy, wouldn't y'all like that? Wouldn't you like to get the paper and look down to it and right there is your preacher in the paper, delinquent. He ain't paid his tax. Boy, there'd be a remedy for that. Send Gene Edwards down there and pay my taxes for me. <laughs> So we pray for our leaders. We obey the law. We pay our taxes. Now look at the latter part. After it says, Render therefore to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due. Custom to whom custom. Now listen, in the middle of the verse, Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. Number four. Convey. Honor and respect to those in office. Boy, it's deathly quiet in here. Sometimes it is the most difficult thing in the world to honor the man in the office. Sometimes instead of honor, instead of respect, I will spit. Not spit on them, but spit. There are a lot of our national leaders, if they were to walk in here this morning, I would not want to stand up. There'd be a part of me that I would just wouldn't do it. Wouldn't want to. But ladies and gentlemen, it is not the person that we honor. It is the position that we honor. It is Mr. President. Mr. Governor. Whether you like him or whether you don't, give honor to those whom honor is due. And there are some judges that are sitting on the bench that we literally call your honor. And there are some judges that need to be taken off the bench and the bench needs to be broke over their head. Amen. But they are still judges and they are still your honor. We Christians, our, our heartbeat is to a different drum. Our allegiance is to our ultimate king. So we give honor to whom honor is due. We fear those whom fear is due. Now, I, I, I'm almost tempted to ask for a show of hands, but I'm not going to. How come is it we're going down the road and some state patrol or sheriff's car or city police or you know what I'm talking about, those funny looking cars with bubblegum machines on top of them. You know what I'm talking about. Got them pretty little blue, 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 blue lights on them. How come is it when we see them? Two things. We either are scared all of a sudden or we're mad. Why? Why? Well, I'll tell you why I'm scared. Because about every time one gets behind me, the first thing I'm thinking of is, did I put my sticker on my tag? Because most of the time I don't put a sticker on it. I go to, I go get it and I put it in the dash and that's where it stays till the next time it's time to go get one. Unless there's an officer who reminds me by the side of the road, uh, your sticker's not on your tag. And so far they've all been very gracious. They could have all given me a ticket 
but they were all very nice and understanding. And I'm grateful for that. So I just kind of freeze. Every time one comes up behind me, I'm thinking, Lord, I hope it's on there. I hope everything's all right. But why is it that we have a tendency, especially if we're going down the road and they're going by us and they go by us and we're going by us. Here I am, I'm over here, I'm running 55 and look at them, they're just doing what they want to. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Had a state trooper explain to me one time why the state troopers fly. He said, have you ever seen an interstate where a state patrolman was running the speed limit? He said, if a state patrol car is running the speed limit on an interstate, they'll have traffic backed up for 20 miles behind them. And nobody will pass one. So we are to convey honor and respect to our leaders. Now, now, these next three I have wrangled from the text, but I want you to listen very carefully. Number five, lay off too much partisanship. Lay off too much partisanship. Are y'all listening to me? This is not the place to discuss the planks in the Republican policy. Nor is it the place to discuss the planks of the Democrats and their policies. I'm not telling you not to be affiliated with a political party. That's not what I'm saying. And I'm not even telling you not to be proud to be affiliated with a political party. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying lay off of too much partisanship. Because here lately we have taken, we've taken scripture, we've taken ethics, and we've taken morality, and we've made it political. And it should have never been made political. Somehow or another, I think, some politician a few years ago, they decided, well, you know, if I'll thump the Bible a little, and if I'll quote a little scripture, it'll get me a few more votes. Are you listening to me? You know, I, I heard this story one time about a fellow his, on his son's 21st birthday. He was wanting to test him to see what kind of fellow that he was going to turn out to be. And so he did this. On the kitchen table, he put a bottle of liquor he put a deck of cards and he put a Bible on the table. If the boy come by and he picked up the bottle of liquor, he was just going to be a, a drunk and a good for nothing most of his life just to barely get through. If he come through and picked up the deck of cards, then he was going to live life in the fast lane. I mean, he was just going to be taking chances and, and, and just live wild and live free and, and, and probably die young. But if he picked up the Bible, maybe he would, he would be a good, salt of the earth kind of person and lead a good, productive life. And so the boy come home and was going through the kitchen to go out the back door and his dad was kind of hid watching to see what he would do. Said the boy went to the table. 
He unscrewed the lid of the liquor and he took him a swig and he put it in his back pocket. He picked up the cards and he shuffled them and he put them in his front pocket. And then he picked up the Bible and put it under his arm and he went out the back door. And his daddy said, oh Lord, he's going to be a politician. <laughs> <laughs> Lay off too much partisanship. There's no need to argue. We can debate things until it starts to get out of hand, and then we need to shut up. You know, it, it's it's good to know when to hush, isn't it? Amen. And, and when tempers begin to get up. When faces begin to get red, when the veins begin to pop out, it's time to hush. Keep it to yourself. Number six, almost the same, but not quite. Be careful what you say. Be careful what you say. When you make a comment about the government, be careful what you say. Little ears are listening to you. Little eyes are watching you. And you may know what you mean, but they don't. Are you listening to me? We need to be careful what we say. We rear back and we say some awful things sometimes. You know that? We say some terrible things. Things that ought not be said. Sometimes we say them and we think we're cute. Sometimes we say it by way of joking and we tell some awful stuff. We need to be careful what we say. If we're going to be a good Christian citizen, hey, we can all take shots at the ones in charge. We can all disagree with everything that's going on. And it depends on what your philosophy of government is. We all have different philosophies of what the government should be. And yet, it seems like every time we turn around, we're calling on the government to do something. Something goes wrong in our lives. And what do we do? Nine times out of ten, we'll say, they, somebody needs to do something about this. I mean, every time we turn around, somebody needs to do something about this. And it's almost like we're, we're inviting the government to take over everything. And when they do, then we're mad about it. And we've given our freedom up. And we've done so by tying it up with a blue ribbon and we've handed it to them. Because the very moment that we think we're going to be able to make a dollar, hello? So be careful what you say. And finally, vote your own way. I've been in the ministry for a long time. I started preaching in 1975. I started pastoring churches in 1977. So what's that make me? About 46 years pastoring. In 46 years of pastoring, I've never endorsed a political candidate from the pulpit, and I never will. For 46 years, I've never told people what to do when you go into that ballot booth. I try to preach the Bible. I try to preach thus saith the Lord. I try to preach morality. I try to preach ethics. I try to tell folks what the Bible said and my prayer is that the Holy Spirit of God would teach the Scripture and get a hold of people and they could be led of the Spirit and they would know what they need to do when it comes to Mark and Adam. But if they don't, 
it's sure not my place to tell them. My grandmother was a fasty little old woman. And she was she wasn't a political person except on election day. And I always had to take mom to the precinct to vote. And I always dreaded it. You know the reason I dreaded it? Because y'all know how it is at the precinct. They folks hanging around from both political parties at the precinct. It's full on both sides. And they're there. A lot of times they, they, they start, you know, they're still politicking in the parking lot while you're walking in there. They're still trying to get, you know, get you to change your vote or, or get you to vote on their side, even while you're trying to get in there. My grandmother loved that stuff. She'd get out. And she'd start making announcements from the time her feet hit the pavement. She started announcing what she was. And no disrespect intended to any one of the political persuasion that I'm fixing to talk about. But my grandma was a Republican with a capital R E P. And she would get out and she would start in the parking lot. She'd say, I want every one of us to know that I'm a Republican. <laughs> and none of you yellow dog Democrats need to even speak to me. <laughs> I wanted to crawl under the car. <laughs> She'd go in the precinct. She would announce it again. I mean, I could almost hear those ladies behind the desk say, Eveline Ware's here again. I mean, she announced it. And then she made me go to the booth with her. And she said, don't you pull that curtain. I don't care if they know how I vote. Now you vote the way I tell you to vote. You make sure you mark it like I tell you. Oh, I hated election day. That's the way my grandma was. That's the only day of the year that she was that way. She went back to normal the next day. Whether she won or whether she lost, that didn't seem to matter. Just so that she could make her statement on election day. I reckon that was good enough for mom. Vote your own way. But vote. Have convictions. Have a conscience. Let it be a well instructed conscience. Well instructed convictions. Do what you ought to do. Using those, what some politicians have called paper ballots. To send the message that you want to send. Let me review. When it comes to being a Christian citizen, number one, we need to pray for our leaders. Number two, obey the laws of the land. Number three, pay your various taxes. Four, convey honor and respect to leaders. Five, lay off too much partisanship. Number six, be careful what you say. And number seven, vote your own way. That's the duties of Christian citizenship. Now, would you bow your heads with me, please? Now, I've been preaching to Christians. By and large, I know the majority of the folks who are sitting out there are Christians, but there's the chance that there might be someone sitting here who's not a Christian. Can I speak to you for just a moment? Maybe in the midst of all of this talking about Christian this and Christian that, Maybe the Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart 
and shown you that, you know what, you're not, you're not even a Christian. And maybe the Holy Spirit even now is in the process of drawing you to Jesus. You can become a Christian before you leave here today. It's not a long, drawn out process and it's not difficult. If you have that sense in your heart, that want to, that desire that you want to become a Christian, then surrender to that. Simply in your heart, say to the Lord, Lord, I want to be a Christian. Lord, I want to turn from my own way and I want to turn to you. Forgive me my sin. I believe you died on the cross for sinners. That means you died on the cross for me. That means you shed your blood for me. And your blood washes away all sin. Which means it washes away my sin. Lord, come into my heart. And let me be a Christian. You can do that today, right there, where you sit, right now. There's no magic in getting up and coming to the front of the church. There's no magic. There's nothing that takes place. It takes place in your heart. But now it very well may be that as a token of what you want to do in your heart, you feel it necessary to slip up out of your seat and come down and kneel right here in this altar in front of this assembly and seal the deal, so to speak. So I give you the privilege and opportunity of coming. And in case there might be some questions you might want to ask, there are those that will be able to, to answer those questions. Some are already coming. Can I have a lady please come up here and pray for this dear one? I'll be down there in just a moment. Thank you, Suzanne. Would there be anyone else who would need to come? Would there be anyone else? I, I, I want to I ask Jesus in my heart today. I want to make it real today. Would you do that? There may be some who are sitting here today who maybe you're members of another church, but you've been coming here and you want to move your membership to Genesis. We can receive you by letter. We can receive you by statement on your statement of faith. If it is in fact that you have been a member of Genesis in the past and you just haven't been for a while and you've come back to the church and you'd like to reinstate your membership, you can do that simply by making a statement to the church this morning. That you would like to reinstate your membership. And, and it will be done so. There's no explanations that are needed. The past will be gone and will go from this time forward. So I extend the invitation to you this morning. To come. To come. Come and join. Come and be saved. Maybe you just want to come and pray this morning. If you just want to come to this altar this morning, it is open to you. Now I'm going to get down at the altar and I'm going to do business. So those of you, please just sit there and pray. You can come up here and pray and just bear with us while we take care of things.
Uh, Amber has come this morning. She said that she made a profession of faith as a, as a little girl, and she was baptized then. But she's come to the point in her life where she wants to live for the Lord, and she wants to be a real Christian. She said she'd like to join this church, and she'd like to be rebaptized. Brethren, she comes as a candidate for baptism after baptism for fellowship of the church. Can I get a move that we receive her? Motion. Can I have a second? Second. Uh, all in favor say amen. 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 Any opposed, you need to get right with God. <laughs> <laughs> right now, this fella needs no introduction. Uh, Mr. Danny, Miss Linda, can you see? Uh, well, we've been missing everybody, obviously. And Danny has joined another church, so he's coming today by letter, and uh, and Linda's coming with him. <laughs> <laughs> so, brethren, we're going to receive them uh, by letter. Can I have a motion? Motion. Second. Second. Everybody say amen if you're amen. 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 Anybody opposed can take it up with Danny. <laughs> I'm going to ask these three, if they would, to go to the back door and they let folks shake hands with you on the way out. And, uh, and so, so y'all just go ahead. I'm just going to put hand on a cup of water. Well, I'm so grateful. Aren't you? You know, the, the Lord calls them home. But extend some to replace him. Right. Amen. Amen. Now, five o'clock ice cream business. Okay. No services this week. So I'll see y'all at six or five. If you don't make it, I'll see you next Sunday. All right. Understand that. Thank you. 